Hey everyone and welcome to our unit on anxiety and impulsivity. Uh, we're going to start off by talking about the neurobiology of anxiety, sort of in broad terms, for our mini lecture number one. So let's start off by defining what we're talking about. Anxiety is expressed in many ways. This can be things like panic episodes, phobic avoidance, so staying away from something that you fear, intrusive thoughts or compulsions, as we might see with OCD, and negative thinking patterns, as we might see with other anxiety disorders. Uh, this is commonly associated, or at least disordered anxiety, is commonly associated with other psychopathologies such as depression, major depressive disorder. Um, this can often manifest in feelings of concern or worry, increased muscle tension, restlessness, impaired concentration, sleep disturbances, and irritability. I'm sure I don't have to explain uh, with too much care to all of you what anxiety feels like, as we are very close to exam week, and I'm sure you can all relate. With uh, anxiety, we see activation of the sympathetic uh, ANS, which can produce increased heart rate, sweating, and other signs of fight or flight response. If you're a little hazy on the autonomic nervous system or fight or flight response type stuff, you can go back to our um, catecholamines unit for a review of how that works. So anxiety is not innately bad, right? It's an adaptive response to, to danger or a demanding situation, or it, it can be at least, right? Um, while it might not always be helpful in modern life, small doses of anxiety can improve or promote optimum performance. Uh, right, knowing that you have an exam coming up might prompt you to pay more attention or to take better notes or to prepare yourself in some way, uh, whereas if you're not worried about it, you may not be motivated to do that. Um, if you have too much anxiety, that can be detrimental to performance, so if you're too stressed out to focus, you might perform poorly. And with repeated cyclical failures, you might become more and more stressed out, like, oh man, I blew the last exam, now this next one's coming up, I'm really worried about it, and it can sort of contribute to a building sort of anxiety. So looking at this figure over here, which I've taken from your text, uh, there are lots of things that can be potential stressors that might cause anxiety. This could be failures, personal losses, insults, time pressures, it could be pretty much anything. A critical step is this right here. The stressor must be perceived as a threat. So with the exam example, if you are ready for the exam, you've been paying attention, you have good notes, you might not see the exam as much of a stressor at all. Whereas if you are the kind of person that's really stressed out by tests or you haven't prepared very well, you might see this as a big threat and it would provoke stress from you. Then there's the sort of uh, interconnection of these three main domains here, bodily effects, upsetting thoughts, and ineffective behavior that can uh, cause and influence one another. Uh, and we'll talk about some of these aspects um, in more detail as we move on. But this is just sort of the general idea of sort of uh, psychologically and to some degree physiologically what stress and anxiety responses look like. So we cannot talk about um, stress and stress disorders and anxiety without talking about the amygdala. Uh, the amygdala, amygdala means almond. If you uh, look under a, a microscope at slices of brain tissue, the amygdala is roughly almond shaped. Uh, this is a major component of several emotion processing circuits. So it's a really, really important part of the brain for, emotioning, uh, for uh, processing emotional content. Um, this receives highly processed sensory and cognitive information from areas like the sensory thalamus, association cortices, and hippocampus. So basically what you need to know from that is there's a lot of different sensory type of information coming in from lots from uh, different routes that's all converging in the amygdala. It also enjoys reciprocal connections with the hippocampus, which is really, really important for learning and memory. So it's really, really well connected to some of our memory centers. Uh, humans show increased activation of the amygdala when they're viewing a negative emotional stimuli. Uh, that's true of everyone, and those with anxiety disorders show even greater activation of the amygdala. In animals, we know that electrical stimulation of the amygdala can produce anxiety and fear, or behaviors a lot like anxiety and, behave, and, and fear, uh, and lesions of this region will produce deficits in uh, that behavior. Uh, let's show that in a little bit more detail here. So here's the general sort of um, highly schematized and highly simplified version of what the amygdala looks like. We have sensory information coming in from the cortex, hippocampal information about uh, context or, and other important factors, and then information coming from the thalamus as well. Uh, this all converges in the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, which can then um, 
send information out to the prefrontal cortex, uh, information back to the hippocampus or to the ventral striatum. And we'll talk about some of these regions. In particular, communication between the amygdala and the hippocampus will become, and the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex will be important for uh, emotion regulation. So all this information uh, converges in the lateral nucleus. Uh, but from there, it needs to get to the central nucleus. The central nucleus is the output structure of the amygdala. So it projects to all these places like the hypothalamus, midbrain, pons, and medulla. These are important uh, sort of behavioral and uh, hormonal output structures, right? We've talked all about the hypothalamus and the HPA axis and how important this structure is for regulating endocrine function. So it should be no surprise that the amygdala, which is the site of convergent information for all of this stress-related information, has a direct path to the hypothalamus. So both directly through uh, sort of direct projections from the uh, lateral nucleus to the central nucleus, or indirectly through a second nucleus called the basolateral nucleus, projections can reach the central nucleus. Now, um, there's a lot more to the amygdala than, than this, but uh, for our purposes, this will do just fine. Uh, also note that there's the BNST, which is the bad nucleus of the stria terminalis. This is a structure which is often called the extended amygdala, and it's really, really important for uh, anxiety. And we'll talk more about that in just a bit. So here's another way of looking at this. Uh, here we have a really, really simplified conditioned fear and anxiety provoking stimuli, so stressful stuff coming into the amygdala. And then out of the central amygdala, we have a projection to all of these different brain regions, right? I'm not going to sit here and read the whole list to you. You can revisit this in your book if you want to look at it in more detail. But there are all of these brain areas that are targets of the, uh, the amygdala's projections that can produce a variety of physiological effects. So changes to respiration, uh, changes in uh, hormonal release, etc. And then we see emotional components of um, this reaction. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about some terminology. Uh, we haven't really nailed these down yet, so let's talk about anxiety versus fear. So fear is a response to a clear and current danger. Um, pretty much everyone refers to this phenomenon as fear, unless you are uh, a member of the Joe Ledoux camp, in which case you would start, you would be calling this threat, and that's a relatively recent uh, change to the nomenclature. So fear and threat are, are generally interchangeable, but I'll use the term fear just because it, it, it fits better with all of the uh, old literature. So fear is a response to a clear and current danger. Um, this is an acute preparedness for a transient danger, which classically implicates the amygdala as being extremely important. So think about this as an immediate threat that you can resolve and deal with. Being afraid of a bear or a snake or something like that is a fear response. Anxiety is a more vague apprehension about potential danger. Right? A sustained preparedness for uncertain danger. Something might happen, but you're not quite sure what. Uh, we know the amygdala is central for this, uh, but a more diffuse network is at play. So while well, the amygdala is certainly important, there are more structures involved in anxiety, including especially the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, BNST, which we mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, this shares a lot of projections uh, to the same regions as the central amygdala. In fact, in, in terms of uh, cell type and cytoarchitecture, the BNST is pretty similar to the amygdala, but it is functionally distinct. And so going back to some of the structures we mentioned earlier, anxiety disorders often arise from an imbalance between these emotion generating subcortical structures, so things like amygdala and BNST, and a higher order quarter hole top down type control. Right, so if our, our frontal cortex is working to regulate emotion, it's in balance with the emotion generating structures uh, subcortically. And an imbalance between uh, those two factors can lead to uh, motion dysregulation and things like phobias and PTSD. But we'll talk in much more detail about the pharmacology of that coming up. So another word on the BNST and anxiety. Uh, we know that chronic restraint or chronic unpredictable stress, so um, the sort of vague uh, threats that are always changing and are not very well predicted can cause a state of anxiety. Uh, this causes increased plasticity, so a lot of structural changes taking place within the BNST in response to unpredictable stressors. This is accompanied by a slew of anxiety-like behaviors. Uh, one of them is uh, in increased anxiety and elevated plus maze. So this is a classic sort of approach that I'll take a moment to explain. So this is the elevated plus maze. You can see here there are four arms, and two of the arms have these walls, and two of these arms have no walls. And having worked with rats a little bit, all of you might have a good idea that 
rats like to be in enclosed dark spaces, right? They don't like to be out in the open. They're prey animals. So being out in the open is anxiety provoking for them. So a normal rat will spend most of its time in these safe arms here. It might venture out to check things out a little bit. An anxious rat is going to spend all of its time in these covered arms and not poke its head out much at all. Whereas a rat in a reduced state of anxiety is going to uh, spend more time out in these open arms and not being afraid. So the uh, elevated plus maze is sort of a classic test of, of anxiety. It's similar in some ways to our um, open field task that we've been using, but uh, different in that it's specifically an asset of anxiety. So let's talk a little bit about the amygdala. Here's another little diagram of uh, some schematized inputs. So the amygdala aids in the formation of emotional memories, as we've talked about previously. Uh, an example of this would be fear conditioning. So this is a, a predictable concrete stimulus that they can be afraid of. They might learn that a uh, normally harmless tone comes to predict the occurrence of an aversive shock, and thus they will learn to fear the tone. The tone is a predictor of something bad that is about to happen. It's not like anxiety where there's a general sense of, oh, something bad could happen. This is fear because this tone predicts something bad is going to happen. Whereas uh, an anxiety a rat might learn this environment is generally unsafe uh, for whatever reason. So in fear conditioning, yeah, the CS tone is associated with the US SOX to show that the rat comes to fear the occurrence of the tone. This is established quickly in as little as one pairing. A rat can learn this for a lifetime and the memory lasts a long time. So here's another way of looking at this. We have information about the tone coming in through auditory thalamus. We have information about the uh, foot shock coming in through uh, somatosensory thalamus, uh, finding its way into the lateral amygdala, and then is making its way, uh, they don't show the, a basal lateral amygdala here, but moving through or uh, avoiding the, BL, the basal lateral complex, it uh, contacts the C central amygdala, which can then contact all of these fear effectors, producing things like freezing, which is just a rodent's response to threats, uh, staying still and trying to avoid detection, increased blood pressure, and hormonal release. Uh, of course, as we mentioned earlier, the amygdala is richly connected to the hippocampus, um, sort of putting it solidly in the memory formation circuit. So yeah, this contributes to memory consolidation. And the hippocampus is also implicated in anxiety disorders because of the rich reciprocal connections it shares with the amygdala as well as the extended amygdala. All right, that's it for our little intro section to uh, anxiety and impulsivity, and we will see you next time.